I'm happy to welcome Dr. Bonnefort from the Toulouse School of Economics. He is our ECI speaker. He studies the, the rational mind considering reasoning, decision making, and moralities. His work appears in journals such as Science, Nature Communication, Nature Human Behavior, and Trends in Cognitive Sciences. His recent research applies the insight of moral psychology and behavioral economics to the new challenges of machine ethics and human AI cooperation. Welcome. Thank you. So thank you all. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to tell you about a very special research project, the Moral Machine. Now, I'm not going to lie, the Moral Machine as a research project can be quite controversial, so we'll get to there. It's also very depressing. So before I spend 40 minutes telling you about people dying, I thought the least I could do was to make you dream. And, of course, the sound which was working perfectly <laughs> five minutes ago. So this is the dream. The future. Fleets of autonomous cars. Crisscrossing, dealing with motorbikes, bicycles, pedestrians, crazy pedestrians. It's magic, right? Of course, some people might start doing things which are kind of dangerous. And I think my favorite is coming right now. Beautiful, right? But before we get there, people are going to die. There will be accidents. And some accidents will be more troubling than others because they will imply moral decisions. So look at this one. This self-driving car is going on, and if it keeps on, it's going to crush this small family here. And the only way to save this family would be to swerve onto a hard obstacle. But then it would harm or even kill the people in the car, this pregnant woman and her son. So what should the car do? By the way, this is not realistic. This is a cartoon. Of course, a self-driving car would not drive that fast as to endanger these people on the, on, on, on the crossing and the people in the car. I could tell you about realistic scenarios, but they're complicated, they take time to describe, and in the end, the question is the same. Who should the car kill? And this question is serious. Car companies take it seriously. Governments take it seriously. And so we should probably take it seriously too. Here are a few quotes. First one uh, is extracted from a Google patent describing risk management by self-driving cars and saying an accident with a pedestrian may be considered very undesirable, I agree, and worse than an accident with another vehicle. In other words, the car would be programmed to hit another car rather than to hit a pedestrian. Ford, Bill Ford, actually. Whose lives are the cars going to save? There are a lot of ethical issues as a society that we have to work through. And same thing for Mercedes. We will implement both the legal framework and what is deemed to be socially acceptable. And here you see a theme. 
socially acceptable. We have to work it through as a society, meaning we cannot leave these decisions to the car companies. And in fact, the car companies do not want to make these decisions. Clearly not. And we cannot simply rely on the existing legal framework because our laws are made for humans. Humans don't really decide what they do in an accident where they have to decide whether to save themselves or to save pedestrians. It all happened in one or two hundred milliseconds. Not enough time to make a reasoned decision. And worse, it has no point to just sit in your room and try to decide what you would do as a driver in such a situation. Because when the situation happens, you don't know what you're going to do. You cannot be programmed. But cars can be programmed. And so we have to decide what they're going to do. So when we started working uh, on this topic with my team, we started with what we thought were easy scenarios. For example, if the car has to decide whether it's going to kill one person on the left or 10 person on the right, what should it do? Or if the car is going to kill 10 people on the road and the only option to save them is to kill its own passenger, what should the car do? And when we started, it did seem that the questions were quite simple and that people pretty much agreed on what a car should do. So for example here, I'm showing you the percentage of people who agree that a car should kill its own passenger to save one, two, five, ten, or more people on the road. And as you can see, agreement raises quickly. In fact, as soon as the car could save two pedestrians, a majority of people say it should sacrifice its passenger. And when we ask them, but suppose you are in the car, do you think the car should kill you? Yeah, I'm going to surprise you. They say yes. But then we ask them, OK, you think it should kill you. Would you buy this car? And here, finally, they say, yeah, no. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not going to go into that today, right? So today, we're only going to speak about moral decisions, what the car should do, not what kind of car I want to buy. So people are saying, yes, yes, a car should kill its own passenger to save 10 people on the road. And we did that many times. So don't worry too much about interpreting the graph, but what it tells you is in most cases, people are pretty sure the car should kill the passenger up to the point where we tried this once, twice. We told them a child was in the car. So should the car kill a child passenger to save 10 pedestrians? And then people started to hesitate. As if the life of a child was worth more. Was maybe worth several lives, several adult lives. So that was interesting. It seemed that if you describe the accidents in a very abstract way, as in kill one person or kill 10 person, people have pretty simple intuitions. But as soon as you start giving features to, the pe to these people, the decision becomes more complicated. The problem is, when you start describing these people with features, the problem space gets huge because you don't have to stop with children. You can have many, many people, many different characters involved in these accidents. And you can have other features of the situations that makes things even more complicated. Look at this one. There's no one in the car. It's a self-driving car. 
So it can, it can go straight, and it's going to kill this older couple. They are jaywalking. The light is red for them. And the only way to save these two people is to swerve and kill this little girl, who is wisely crossing at the, at the green light. OK, can you raise your hand if you think the car should kill the little girl? <laughs> and can we, can we please have a camera <laughs> shoot on the audience? <laughs> because what I'm seeing here is not a single hand raise. <laughs> Right, what I did here was to pile on things. Having an old couple and a little girl, having this old couple cross at the red light, having them in front of the car. So I'm piling up features of the scenario that are supposed to make people very uncomfortable with the decision that the car should save the greater number. But as I said, the problem space gets huge. Because when, you, when we, you do groups of one to five people, say, that each character is described by features, such as sex and age, and so on, and then you change things in the environment, such as green light and red lights, you get into millions and millions of scenarios. And, well, I'm a social scientist. My job is to get the opinion of people on those scenarios. But I cannot have millions of scenarios. Because, of course, I cannot only ask one person per scenario. And even if I were to cut down this number to maybe 100,000 or 10,000 scenarios, I would still need a staggering amount of people. And if I get even more ambitious, if I say, hey, I don't want to get responses from people only in Sweden or only in the United States, because these responses might depend on culture. So I would like to get data from many different countries over the world. Then I set myself up to an impossible task, because I need so many people. But we tried anyway. And the key was to find a way to get massive voluntary participation to our study. And the tool for that was to develop a website that we tried very hard to make viral. So it's called the Moral Machine. Anyone has been on the Moral Machine website already? OK. So if you've, not, if you've never seen it, I'm going to show you. So it looks like this. It has many uh, features that you see here. It's available in 10 languages, including Arabic, uh, Chinese, Korean, Russian, Japanese. We'll stick to English. And but there are many features on the website, but the one I'm going to describe and the one that people use the most is the judge feature. So you go into judge, and you get this. Scenarios. The website is generating scenarios. You will never see the same scenario twice. And, uh, well, yeah, you will never see the same scenario twice because there are so many. And you just have to click. Hmm. I'm not sure I even see a difference here. So I'm just going to go straight. Oh, easy, right? The animals are jaywalking. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, wait. They don't know that. <laughs> so it's unfair. <laughs> but I'm still going to kill the animals. And so on, right? And so on and so forth. So a lot of work went into this website because we wanted lots of people to go there, and we wanted them to recommend the website to their friends, to uh, share it on social networks. So the user experience has to be uh, slightly gamified. People have to be able to get into the fun part very, very, very quick. 
And we used uh, some tricks, to be honest, like giving people a mirror that after 12 scenarios, the website is telling you what kind of person you are. Based on your choices. For example, due to the randomness of the generator of the scenario generator, maybe you kill a lot of women. And then the website is going to tell you, mm, you have a strong preference for saving men. And you're going to say, no, no, that's not me. And then we'll tell you, oh, oh, if you disagree with that, maybe you would like to fill a survey <laughs> telling us about your preferences and perhaps your income, education, age, political views, and religion, and so on. There are options for people who really get into this, so they can create their own scenarios, post them on the website, get feedback from other users. Of course, as I said, it had to be available in many languages. It took a lot of planning, but in the end, uh, mostly, we were very lucky. And the thing that worked really nicely is that at some point, people started to post videos on YouTube of them playing the moral machine. And this helped a lot to actually get the website out there and to get a lot of people taking the survey. So I cannot resist showing you this. These are people on YouTube doing the moral machine. We're going to do a test here today called the moral machine. It's a completely original idea that has never been done before on YouTube. Wait, wait, wait. First question, why is there two homeless people with a baby and a male doctor? Who knows, man? You just have to just go for it. So obviously, to you me, choose in the this lesser case, loss of life. You choose the lesser loss of life. Yeah. Okay, so to me, saving more lives matters a lot to me. Three is greater than two. But homeless probably wouldn't have a family. Awesome. This is a plus. He has a really terrible life, so maybe it's not as bad for him. If, if we had to ask him the question, would you sacrifice? Because then his life had meaning. Yeah. You know? All right, now it's getting a little trickier. This is a moral machine. Do it. Elderly. My, my logic here is the same. If, if these fucking morons. Go in a red light, it's on them. But there's a or, criminal. But there's a baby. That's so true. <laughs> it's a car with dogs in it. I think the car should default to protecting the people in the vehicle. I think it should kill the occupants. Or I might can't kill, kill kids. Like, you can't kill kids, but you also can't kill grandma. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. It's really, really, really hard to say. You can't do you can't do either of these. Baby lives matter more than baby lives matter. Hashtag baby lives matter, guys. Uh, baby lives matter. Kill the kids. Thank you. If the cars are driving and you can swerve to avoid a pedestrian uh, who maybe wasn't paying attention, it's not your fault. Uh, but if you swerve, you're going to go into a wall and might kill yourself. That you you can have that machine make that decision, uh, but that's a moral decision, uh, not just. Uh, uh, a pure utilitarian decision, and uh, who's setting up those rules? Do we have broad consensus around what those rules are? That's going to be important. Yeah, that's going to be important, indeed. And it's hard to get consensus, as we discovered on the moral machine. Of course, we're going to find that there are things that matter a lot of people, but as you've seen in these videos, people often disagree on what is the most important. So, very quickly, when you go to the moral machine, you get a session. So a session means, means a series of 13 scenarios before you get you know, uh, a description of yourself. One of these scenarios is completely random. Completely random means it's taken from, I think, a space of a billion scenarios. And then we have two scenarios testing uh, several things we're interested in. So two scenarios test the number of person. Two scenarios test the species. So by the way, I originally disagreed on using uh, two scenarios uh, to compare human lives and animal life. But some of our virality consultants told us that would, go, that would get us a lot of uh, Facebook posts. And it's true. People seem to love 
posting screen captures of them killing cats and saying, oh, I feel so bad about that, but I'm a dog person, or so on. We test age, we test health. Well, health was a bit hard. It was hard to, to find a very visual way to test it. So in the end, we had uh, people doing jogging, people overweight, and uh, people in the middle, regular adults. And we had something pretty controversial, which was the social status, and in particular, the homeless person. So I'm going to tell you later why we included the homeless person there. All right, so I'm going to uh, go through quickly, because I want to keep time for questions. So here we go. In January, we hit 40 million decisions. 40 million decisions means that we had 40 million observations of, one, of someone clicking left or right in a scenario. Number of people, harder to say. S several people might use the same machine. The same person might connect from different devices. So we definitely have millions of people who participated to the survey, but getting an exact number is tricky. This, uh, of course, the numbers are, have increased since January, but what I'm going to tell you about are, uh, the is the analysis of the 40 million responses we got up to January. Mostly, the responses come from uh, North America, Western Europe, Russia, and Brazil, but we have a lot of coverage. In fact, we got responsive for 250 countries, I think, now. And we kept 125 countries for cultural analysis, meaning uh, the 125 countries where we had the larger uh, sample sizes. So the map shows you the coverage. Uh, of course, there's still a lot of white there. But essentially, uh, what you see in white are parts of the world uh, without a high density of internet connection. So essentially, uh, we're covering every part of the world where people have easy access to the internet. All right. I'm going to tell you about the results. But I have a favor to ask. I would ask you to please uh, not take pictures of the slides and the figure and not post them on social networks. OK? Thank you. So here we go. First, just a quick look at the characters who are saved and killed the most. So this is essentially the change in probability of being saved compared to the regular adult as a baseline. So the longer the bar on the right, the greater uh, your advantage compared to the regular adult. The longer the bar on the left, the greater your penalty compared to a regular adult. So if you look at the bottom of the chart, you can see that the criminal is somewhere between the cat and the dog. And then if you go to the uh, upper part of the chart, you can see that the characters who are saved the most are the baby, the little girl, the little boy, the pregnant woman. I'm sure you can sense a theme here. Baby, kids, pregnant women. And then nothing spectacular happens on this in the middle of the graph. But what's important is not to look at every character individually, but to look at the nine dimensions of the decisions that we could analyze. All right. So, these nine dimensions, I see on the left, intervention, meaning do you go straight or do you turn? Uh, do you save passenger or pedestrian, men or women, uh, fit people or overweight people, social status, people would jaywalk or not? Ooh, uh, something was reversed here. Okay. Uh, age, number of character species. So, Let's go, uh, let's start from the bottom. 
what you see here is that if in one scenario we replace a pet by a human, any human, conditional on the distribution of all the other variables, the change in probability that people will click on the part where we substituted an animal with a human, the change of probability is 0.6. So it's huge. Fine, right? People want to save humans, not, anim not animals. And then you can see that the number of characters, again, number of characters means conditional on every feature that these characters have. Or maybe more uh, in a clearer fashion, everything else being equal. So everything else being equal, you can see the effect of adding one character, two characters, three characters, four characters, and the average effect of the number of characters. So you can see that uh, we get the same fixed size when we add three characters as the effect size when we replace a dog by a human. And the last of the big three is age. So what I'm showing you here is not uh, turning a grandmother into a baby. It's the average effect of moving down one age category to another. So elderly to adult, adult to kid, kid to baby. So these are the big three. People want to save human lives. People want to save many lives. People want to save young lives. And after that, we get in something a bit scary, which is that the homeless person has the same effect of jaywalking. Or to say that differently in this study, it's just like being a homeless person is like jaywalking all the time. And this is where I need to explain why we put the homeless person there. Because at first, a car cannot say if someone is homeless. So it's nothing to do with anything realistic, with the choices made by the cars. What we wanted to do was to have a character there that would give us a striking example that what we were doing was not a voting exercise. We are not saying to governments, look at our data, and you just have to apply that. Because if we did that, we would say, let's kill all the homeless persons. We have the homeless person here to remind us that these data are not a reason for any government to dispense with some serious social discussion with citizens. Anyway, these are the global tendencies. But of course, what we want to see is, do we have differences as a function of countries or culture? So just for illustration, here is the thing we can do. We have this nine-dimensional vector, which means the nine weights on the nine preferences that we're computing. And we can compute this vector for every country. So I'm just showing you things here for Europe. And don't spend too much time scrutinizing this, because there are not that many differences. European countries are pretty much homogeneous in the way they make their decisions on the moral machine. But things get more interesting when we get outside of Europe and when we consider the entire world. So what we did was to get this moral vector for each country and then use a clustering algorithm to try and find clusters of countries which made similar decisions and decisions dissimilar to other clusters. The algorithms, by the way, did not know where the countries were. It just worked from the moral vectors without knowing the location of the countries. But when we look at the clusters, location is obviously important 
in some ways, but not in others. Okay. So what we find are three big clusters. One of them is, yeah, one of them is the Western cluster. So essentially what we think as the Western world. Broadly construed, because look at this, look at this tiny cluster here. United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, United States, Canada. And South Africa is just there. Meaning that we have this very small cluster with all the British colonies scattered all across the world. It's fascinating that these countries on different continents still share a legacy in the way they do moral judgment. So the Western cluster is very big. Then we've got the Eastern cluster, where we find essentially Asian countries and Muslim countries. And we got the Southern cluster, which essentially has the whole of South America and countries in the Southern Hemisphere, plus this interesting things here, France. But not only France. France, Morocco, Algeria, French Polynesia, Reunion, New Caledonia, Martinique. Yeah, maybe you don't realize what's the common point here. And my co-authors did not either. They told me, we've got this weird cluster. We don't know what's the common point with this country. What? Martinique, New Caledonia, Reunion, <laughs> Algeria, Morocco? Yeah, French colonies and territories. We find this again, the legacy of the colonizing country. So we have these three big clusters, Western, Eastern, Southern. But of course, now that we have these clusters, what we want to know is how different they are. How do they make the decisions? So here we go. So this is the Western cluster. And what you see here, uh, radially, you've got the nine moral dimensions. The black circle here means that this cluster is at the word average for the importance of the dimension. The further you go outside of the black circle, the, most, the more important is the, is the dimension. The further you go inside the black circle, the less important the dimension. So the Western uh, cluster is basically at zero everywhere, but that's normal, that's mechanical. Because it's, it, it, the Western cluster is basically half the population, so it defines the word average. So the fact that it's just here centered on average is not interesting. What's interesting is, is how the other clusters deviate from the black circle. And quickly again, if we look at the Eastern cluster, for example, we find that uh, age, has a much smaller effect, which means that countries in the aging cluster, to say it simply, don't kill old people as much as in the West. The number is also much less important, meaning that again, countries in the Eastern cluster care about the number of people less. And when we look at the southern cluster, uh, which includes France, again, some, uh, well, yeah, this striking thing is here. Southern clusters, countries in the southern cluster have a high preference for saving women. And care a lot about social status. So countries in the southern cluster tend to kill the homeless person more, for example. All right, so this is just a description. We don't have an explanation right now. So to try and get at an explanation, 
we can start correlating the use of a dimensional neural machine to social and economic indicator in each country. And uh, not going go to go through all the graphs, but let's say this one. As I just mentioned, some countries kill the homeless more. Some countries care about social status more. And each dot here is a country. And when you look at the economic inequality in a country, the Gini score, you can see that it correlates pretty well with the importance given to social status. In other words, the economic inequality in a country translates into a, a bias against low status characters on the moral machine. Other ones include here a correlation between the rule of law and uh, killing people with jaywalk. So essentially, the stronger is the legal, are the legal institution in a country, the harsher the penalty on the indemoral machine for people who cross at the red light. And finally here, this one is, is a bit harder, but this is about, uh, I'm going to tell you in the opposite direction, this is about killing women on the moral machine. And what we find is that there's a correlation which, what, with, with what is called the gender gap in health and survival. The gender gap in health and survival is an index of missing female babies. That is a surprising lack of female babies in a country, which is usually explained either by selective abortion of female uh, fetuses or, uh, well, selective infanticide. So the more a country lacks female babies, the more responses from that country kill women on the moral machine. So what we find on the moral machine seems to be highly dependent on the cultural, social, and economic situation of a country. I really want to keep some time for questions, so I'm going to skip here. And to be very quick, what we found is that there are global foundations that we can build on. Save the humans, save the many, save the young. Interestingly, the only country so far that created a governmental commission to advise on the ethics of cell cars in just these situations came with uh, conclusions that are uh, differentially consistent with this. For example, the German Commission said that saving the humans was mandatory, that saving the many was optional, and that saving the kids was forbidden. Actually, what they said was, we think it is morally unacceptable and sh it should be forbidden for the cars to use any kind of individual information about the people in the accident to decide who to kill, as, and that includes their age. The, there are foundations, but there are also cultural differences. So maybe we will not get into universal agreement about these topics, but the fact that uh, the clusters are largely uh, location-driven location means that at least local convergence is possible. And I just want to hammer it down one last time. This is not a voting exercise. We don't want to tell governments to just do what people say on the moral machine. But at least we want governments to be aware of the preferences expressed there, because it will give them the tools to decide what needs to be explained carefully to their citizens, and also the tools to expect the strong backlash the day a self-driving car does something that people strongly oppose of. Thank you. Questions? 
people that want to take question, to give, to make questions, needs to go to the microphones over there. So here first. Yeah. Okay, Juan Liu from Arizona State University. So, first of all, thank you for this uh, talk. And uh, it seems like in the, I have two questions. One is. It seems the car needs to know uh, way more than the human driver knows. You have to know the sex, you have to know the age, you have to know pregnancy, all of these things. And when you face an accident, it's not possible for you to, under, to, uh, to be aware of these. Second is, when you do the thought experiments, I think, I don't know, do you assign the role to these uh, participants? Are they drivers or are they decision makers? So from my point of view, I think we should follow the law, right? Whoever will be responsible, they should be making the decision. So the point is, when they do the experiments, they have to play some roles. Otherwise, they just change roles. They can do anything they want. Thank you. OK, thank you. I I'm not sure I got the second part, but at least I can address the first one. Yeah, there are many things here that the cars would not be able to see, right? Uh, sex, uh, social status, fitness. But the big three, remember, the big three is humans number age, or at least human number kid. And this, the top three is achievable technically. Human versus animal is easy. Number is not that hard, and what the engineers tell me is that kid is quite feasible too. Hi, wait, th there's a line on the side too. Can we do alternating? <laughs> Hi, um, Peter Stone from the University of Texas at Austin. So first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I think there's very uh, interesting results that are coming out of this, but it strikes me that the moral decisions that you're looking at here are not ones that people, that really come up very often. People don't face these often, not ever in their lifetime. And you can tell in the video that, that people are sort of um, laughing at it a little bit, saying this is a fun game. Um, it's hard to, to be confident that what they say they would do is actually what they would do in real life. It's not something that ever comes up. So I wonder, what would, you know, first of all, does this have to be about killing people, killing things? There's moral decisions that come up all the time, like whether to lie, whether to cheat, that people have real experience with. Why make this about the trolley problem, which is sort of a, a very um, fashioned kind of problem and not an everyday one? <clears throat> uh, okay, so first, of course people don't do that all the time. And, 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 and to me, that's why uh, self-driving cars are so fascinating because they're suddenly actualizing what so far was just a thought experiment. And uh, uh, do what they say here is really what they would do? No, because as I said uh, when I started the talk, nobody knows what they would do in such a situation. And that's not the point. The point is that you cannot be programmed, but you can say what you w w want the car to do, and that is going to be binding once it is programmed. Very nice, very nice talk and study, thank you. I was gonna ask a very similar question to what Peter asked. I, I, presumably, we could try to gather some information about what people do actually do, and I wonder if you made some effort to try to do that. Sorry, say again? Um, you could imagine, it would be challenging, but you could try to gather data on what people actually do. Oh. Yeah, so, so some people have been uh, trying to do that with driving simulator. I'm still not convinced that uh, this is what we should do. I think we have a moral duty to program these cars under reflective equilibrium. That is, that we have to think hard about what we would like them to do and not just have them copy what we do in 100 milliseconds without having any time to make the decision. So I'm, I think this is a better way than just collecting data in the driving simulator, surprising people with accidents. A question on your right. Um, have you studied how easily uh, people change their minds, for instance, after you show them some statistics about what other people do? Which kind of statistics? Uh, I mean, uh, what, what the preferences of other people are in the same game. Right. Yeah, we, uh, yes, what we uh, 
So we, we, we try to analyze responses up to the point where, where we get the information on the other people and responses after that, we don't get any change. So last question and then we'll take it offline. So thank you for a great talk. Um, you mentioned you don't see this as a voting exercise, but at the same time you advocate using it at least to some extent to guide legislatures, uh, le legislators and regulators. And I was wondering if, um, if you're not optimizing for it going viral and instead you want to optimize for seriously guiding legislators or actually thinking of it as a vote, what would you change? Well, that, that will be a, a work for governments, but, but again, what I want, I, I want to take this opportunity to say it again. So, we think that what we have here is important data for the regulators to zero in what they find the most interesting twist or what they find is the most interesting problem for their population. And then I think we will have to go through, well, what governments do when they want to consult the population, but uh, I'm, not a, you know, I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> I don't advise on that. So guys, uh, I can't take any more questions, but uh, I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna stick around here, and I can take other questions in the hall later. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>